What we need is not more medication, but more education, because the best prescription is knowledge. This is Exposé, coming to you live from Lagos, Nigeria, every Monday on Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook simultaneously. I'm the regular host, Tony Akiyam. Don't, don't forget, what we need what is we not need more medication, more medication but more but education, more education because the best prescription is knowledge. Hello and welcome to Expose with Tony Akinyemi. This is the first Monday of the month of August 2022. I welcome you to the beginning of another segment in this series. From today, we'll be talking about therapeutic gases. Therapeutic gases. I'm sure we all know that matter exists in three forms, basically. We have solid, we have liquid, and we have gases, okay? So solid, liquid, and gas, that's how matter exists. Now we'll be looking at the gases, and which of the gases can be used medically? Which of the gases can be used therapeutically? Those are the ones I call therapeutic gases. Now, there are toxic gases, poisonous gases, and there are medical gases. Poisonous gases are those that are toxic to us. Medical gases are the ones that can be used for our benefit in improving our health. So let's talk about toxic gases versus medical gases. Now, so what are toxic gases? Now, toxic gases are those that are capable of causing damage to living tissues or causing impairment to the central nervous system or causing severe illness, or in extreme cases, causing even death when they are ingested, inhaled, or even absorbed by the skin or the eyes. Those are toxic gases. They can cause damage to living tissues. They can cause impairment to our central nervous system. They can cause severe illness and in extreme cases can lead to fatality. They can cause death when they are ingested or they are inhaled or they are even absorbed through our skin or through the eyes. Now, so what are medical gases? Medical gases are those that have medical application both in conventional medicine and in alternative medicine. Those are called medical gases. I'm sure you'll be wondering, are there gases that they use in medicine? Of course, you know that they put people on oxygen. Is oxygen not a gas? <laughs> yeah, that's a medical gas. And I'll be talking about others after. But let's start with the toxic ones and do away with those because that's not our focus. Our focus is to look at the therapeutic ones, the medical gases. So let's talk about toxic gases. I'll just talk about three as representative in the category. Now, there are very common, the common types of toxic gases that we encounter, you know, that human beings encounter, particularly in confined spaces. You know, God has made the atmosphere in such a way that um, there is a purification, a purification system that God has put in place, that when toxic gases escape into the atmosphere, within the, short, the shortest possible time, there is a mechanism for cleaning up, for sanitizing the air. God has made the atmosphere like that, self-cleaning, self-sanitizing, such that outdoor air usually doesn't stay toxic for too long, even when toxic gases are emitted into the air. It dissipates very quickly. Isn't God wonderful? Of course, except if there is a continuous emission, non-stop emission, as one is being cleared off, new ones are replacing them, and that makes it a very dangerous one. Uh, I traveled to River State in Nigeria uh, in the last couple of years, probably three, four, five years back now, um, 2018, 2019, you know, like that. And, and 
I, I saw that there is this black thing that is floating all over the place and settling like powder all over the place. And I've been talking to people in Port Harcourt and the, the, that's, that axis generally in River State. What are you people doing? Why are you all just quiet? And just sitting down there, tetere bundukwasli, without doing anything about this. You say, but what are we going to do? You need to make some noise. You need to make some noise. You cannot just be quiet and, and let those who are supposed to be responsible for stopping that nonsense just sit down there doing nothing. You need to find out where those toxic things are coming from, and they must stop it because it's endangering human health and even animal health. Very, very toxic and dangerous, and yet people are living in there. They are inhaling it every now and then. I call on the River State government and other governments around that area, as well as the federal government and the people of River State in Nigeria, rise up and do something about that gas. I'm concerned. I'm worried. Uh, and I think it would be the proper thing to do to rise up to the occasion and do something about that terrible thing that has polluted the air in that part of the world. Also, in cities like Lagos, where I live, there are factories, there are industrial areas, and there are a lot of emissions continuously emitting into the air and polluting the air. And because of the growth of the city and development in the city, nowadays you find residential estates adjacent to industrial estates. And so these emissions are coming from the factories and they are settling on the residential area. I used to live in one of those residential estates many years ago, about 15 years ago. I had to relocate from there because my little boy, who was five, six, seven years old at the time, was always having his eyes red and itchy and he would have to rub and rub and rub and rub. He was having breathing difficulties and all of that because of the pollution that was there. Okay. So I had to take a decision uh, as the head of the family, you know, to relocate my family from that neighborhood into another neighborhood that is saner and cleaner. Now, government needs to regulate these things and not to allow such things to ever happen. All right. Now, let, let me leave that alone and let's come to three common toxic gases that people can come in contact with, particularly in confined spaces. Those who work in laboratories, those who work in different offices and rooms, okay? The three of them are hydrogen sulfide, carbon monoxide, and certain solvents. Let's take them one by one, toxic gases. Now, hydrogen sulfide is also known as sewer gas. It's a colorless gas with the odor of rotten eggs, right? Now, sulfur, normally when it's, it's it, it deteriorates, actually, it, it smells like rotten egg, right? So excessive exposure to hydrogen sulfide has been linked to many uh, confined space deaths. Some people have inhaled and inhaled and inhaled hydrogen sulfide, and they have died. Hydrogen sulfide causes, first of all, a loss of our sense of smell. When you inhale the gas and inhale it for a while, after some time, it will numb your ability to perceive odor. So you continue to inhale more of it and you can't even perceive the rotten egg smell anymore. You don't even know you are inhaling more than necessary. And so this causes people to mistakenly think that the gas has left the space. Now, hydrogen sulfide inhibits the exchange of oxygen on the cellular level. And that causes asphyxiation. That makes the person to become low on oxygen, such that the person's oxygen level, if you have an oximeter to check the amount of oxygen in the person's blood, it keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping until the person passes out. That's a toxic gas, hydrogen sulfide. The second one that people even come in contact with in their own homes, in this part of the world in particular, is carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide is an odorless, colorless gas that is formed by burning carbon-based fuel, such as gas or wood and what have you, you know, kerosene and petrol and diesel and all of that. Now, carbon monoxide inhibits the body's ability to transport oxygen to all parts of the body. And once you can no longer supply oxygen to all parts of your body, you are going gradually. Now, we have read in newspapers and 
magazines and journals in Nigeria that whole families have died in their bedroom sleeping because of carbon monoxide you know, poison or poisoning. Now, they, they put on their, I better pass my neighbor generator. That's what we call it in this part of the world. This very little, portable, affordable generator. Because power failure in Nigeria is, is a big menace, okay? We don't have regular power supply. We don't have uninterrupted power supply yet. But I believe that very soon, by the special grace of God, things will change, all right? Uh, particularly as we go into the next general elections, I want to encourage every one of us in Nigeria to please vote the right candidates. Vote the right candidates. And mark my words, I didn't say vote the right parties. I said vote the right candidates. Those we know will turn things around for good. We have that civic responsibility to do that to make sure the right people get into positions of power and authority so that things can change. But for now, we live without uninterrupted power supply. So almost every household has either lanterns or candles or generators and what have you. And there have been stories of families who put on generators. They put it in the corridor and then so in order to have light overnight so that at least they can put on their fan and blow away mosquitoes so they can sleep and have peace. Because we have a lot of mosquitoes also in this part of the world, in the tropics. And these mosquitoes will not just come and feed JJ and go away. They also want to sing music. They want to sing lullaby for you. And so they come and they do, and people can't sleep. They wake them up. So because of that, people like to sleep under the fan so that the fan can blow away the mosquitoes. All right? And so they buy these generators and they put it on overnight. They sleep and the emission from these portable generators fill the whole room and the gas reaches toxic levels. They inhale those gases, and sometimes the whole family had been wiped out through carbon monoxide poisoning. Very sad and sorrowful, okay? But that's another toxic gas, particularly in confined spaces that can kill or can cause damage to the nervous system, damage to tissues, or some other systems in the body. The third one comes from you know, toxic gases come from solvents. We use solvents in many ways. Solvents such as kerosene, such as gasoline, petrol, okay, paint, strippers, such as degreasers, things that we use to remove grease. Okay? These, these solvents are not only flammable, in other words, they can catch fire, but if you inhale the fume coming out of them, they have a high concentration of such toxic elements that can cause central nervous system effects. Okay? Central nervous system effects can include dizziness, it can include drowsiness, it can include lack of concentration, confusion, headaches. Some people can even go into coma and others can die. Now, as I travel around the world, I have noticed that in most Western cultures, in advanced countries, most of the time their filling stations are self-service filling stations, most of the filling stations. The customer drives and pulls up at the pump. You get down from your car, you open your own uh, car uh, petrol compartment, and then you take the pump from the dispenser and you put it in your tank and dispense the gas and pay. Of course, you can pay with your debit card or credit card, or you can go into the store to make your cash payment, and then you say, okay, I am on pump number 13. And then they will, of course, program the pump to dispense the amount of petrol that you have paid for. All right? So you get there, you put the pump in your own tank, and you dispense the pump, the, the fuel, you cover your tank. And then you hang the, and you drive off. You don't find petrol attendants attending in most of those filling stations. Of course, in a few of them, you still have attendants attending to people. But they are beginning to change from that. Now, I think one of the health implications for that is that when a petrol attendant stays with that petrol pump and is the one dispensing it from morning till night, there is a tendency for that petrol attendant to be inhaling the emissions that are coming from the petrol. And when you inhale that and inhale that and inhale that for long, it has health implications. So when you allow self-service 
each individual dispensing for themselves, the amount, the quantity that that person will inhale will be so negligible, so small, that it may not impact the health of that person. So everybody takes a little <laughs> and then walks away. But when one person stays there and is inhaling all day, hmm, that has very serious implications because that is a toxic gas. Now let's leave the toxic gases alone because that's not our focus. Our focus is on the therapeutic gases or medical gases. Now, I'll tell you at least seven most common types of medical gas therapies available, both in conventional medical practice as well as in alternative medical practice. These are called medical gas therapies. We have oxygen therapy, we have helium oxygen therapy or heliox, and then we have nitrous oxide therapy, the third one, and the fourth one is nitric oxide therapy, the fifth one is carbon dioxide therapy, the sixth one is ozone therapy, and the seventh one is hydrogen therapy. Now some, some people think that ozone is actually toxic, but that's not true. Medical ozone is not toxic. I, I categorize it under therapeutic gases or medical gases rather than as toxic, a toxic gas. So I'll be taking each of these seven medical gases and talk briefly about four of them, but then I will zero in on three of them that are particularly very relevant, very useful, that can be used almost anywhere. I'll be talking in details about hydrogen therapy, about oxygen therapy, and about ozone therapy. Those three, I will spend time on them. But then I will just make a costly look, take a costly look at helium oxygen therapy, nitrous oxide therapy, nitric oxide therapy, and carbon dioxide therapy. Don't go away. I'll be back shortly. This is Expose with Tony Akemi, brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. What we need is not more medication but more education for the best prescription is knowledge. I'll be back shortly. Introducing Healthy Newsletters on various health topics by Reverend Tony Akiyemi. Order, call, plus messages I've been listening. But my husband is always telling me, let us go for this training. This is unique. Of course, I read food science in the school, but his own, the presentation is different. So I choose to come and I came for cooking class four years ago. I know we cannot quantify this training for all we have been taking, all the in-between is so wonderful. And the knowledge, something came to my mind when he was giving us the last lecture today. Something told me, I said, this is upgrading because the last time I spoke with him, I discovered that so many things he mentioned here are new things that are coming to nutrition. I was not telling, I said, these people, the more you run after them, you discover you will never meet them because I discovered some of the things he's saying, there are new things that are coming. So there are so many new things that I know I will still learn. So I'm looking forward for Modi 2 too, very shortly, not long, long time. I'll come for Modi 2 and Modi 3. 
Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. God bless you. Welcome back to Expose with Tony Akinyami. This is brought to you by the Shepherd's Flock International Church. Please visit our website at www.tsfchurch.com. There's a lot you can see. We have some videos also there for you to watch. And then we have a number of things that you can explore at our website. Much more, we invite you to worship God with us, fellowship with us at any of our centers, any of our parishes in Nigeria and the United Kingdom. Uh, you'll be blessed joining us to worship the Almighty God as we serve Him in spirit and in truth. Okay, so we are discussing therapeutic gases, and I spent the first half of today's episode, first of all, identifying two categories of gases, the toxic ones, and the ones that have medical application. Now, I've talked about three types of toxic gases that we need to, you know, make every effort to avoid in our lives. And then I've talked about seven different types of medical gas therapies. Uh, I'll be touching briefly on just four of them, and then I will zero in extensively on three of them. That's hydrogen therapy, oxygen therapy, and ozone therapy. Now, medical gases have and continue to be highly effective and widely used both in conventional and alternative uh, medical practice in the treatment of a wide range and variety of ailments. Now, exciting new developments have shown that those that are suffering with COVID-19 can also benefit from a variety of these gases, particularly ozone, oxygen, and hydrogen, maybe also nitrous oxide and even nitric oxide therapy. All right, so we're going to be looking at each of the uh, medical gases one by one very briefly before we zero in on the last three that I'll be very extensive on. So let's look at heliox therapy. The word heliox is a combination of helium and oxygen, a combination of helium gas with oxygen gas to administer to a patient. Now, heliox generally refers to a mixture of 21% oxygen and 79% helium. So the helium portion is higher than the oxygen portion. Now, heliox requires less energy to ventilate the lungs. So the work of breathing is reduced because heli helium gas is lighter. So when the person is having difficulty breathing, they can mix the helium with the oxygen. So it makes breathing a lot easier. The workload on the person that is already very weak, okay, is, is lighter. Now, heliox has been used for almost 100 years, and it was the key to the treatment of acute asthma in those days before bronchodilators were invented. Now, bronchodilators are medications and inhalers and different things that help to, you know, widen the bronchial tube so that an asthma patient that is choking can actually breathe. When somebody has an asthma attack, usually what happens is that the person is able to inhale air, but exhaling the, the air becomes very difficult. So because of constriction in the bronchial tubes. So bronchodilators help to dilate or widen, relax the bronchial tubes so that air can go in and come out easily. Now, before bronchodilators became popular, people used things like uh, Ventolin and Franol and different kinds of things. And by the way, magnesium is also a very natural bronchodilator, by the way. Okay, so that's why green vegetable juices help a lot as a bronchodilator. And then you can also use Soleil. Soleil is a salt solution that is made with um, Himalayan pink salt or Celtic sea salt. Maybe we'll talk about that some other day. But I'm just talking about natural bronchodilators versus pharmaceutical bronchodilators, which are now readily available and they have saved many lives from dying from asthma attacks. But before that time, heliox gas was what was being used, you know, in accomplishing that kind of support for uh, asthma patients 
some 100 years ago. Okay. Now, heliox is mainly used when there is a condition of large airway narrowing, such as an upper airway obstruction due to tumors or foreign bodies lodging in that passageway, or when there is a vocal cord dysfunction, that can narrow the, you know, the larger airways, and that may need some support. That individual may need some support. So when you mix 79% uh, of helium gas, gas with 21% of oxygen, and that person is administered that, uh, and he begins to inhale it, it makes breathing a lot easier for that person. And heliox, that is helium plus oxygen, has proven helpful with problems of the medium airways as well, such as when the person has crop or asthma or COPD, that's chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases, emphysema and the rest of them like that. So that is heliox gas therapy. The second therapy I'll be talking about today is nitrous oxide therapy. That's different from nitric oxide therapy. They are similar, but they are slightly different. Now, nitrous oxide therapy is, is used again because of its anesthetic and analgesic effect. Now, anesthesia means it will numb your feeling of pain. And then analgesic is also uh, pain relief. But anesthesia uh, is like when somebody is going under the knife for surgical operation and they administer anesthesia, total anesthesia, the person just passes out, so to speak. They will cut the person open, sew the person up, the person will not even feel it. That's anesthesia. But analgesic is a pain reliever. It can come in the form of injection, in the form of a tablet or capsule or whatever. Now, medical grade nitrous oxide gas is normally used by surgeons and dentists because of these two effects, the anesthetic effect and the analgesic effect. Now, scientists are investigating inhaled nitric oxide's potential to treat COVID-19 symptoms. Now, it works in different ways, you know, to get the body uh, to be able to tolerate whatever it is that it is going through. Now, Dr. Keith Scott, a medical doctor, uh, was the principal investigator of a clinical trial on the use of nitrous oxide therapy. And he said that he has been using nitrous oxide as a therapeutic gas in various therapies, you know, for long. I quote him. He said, I have used this gas for 20 plus years to treat acute respiratory syndrome and heart issues. That's Dr. Keith Scott, a medical doctor. Now, the third medical gas that we'll be talking about is nitric oxide, nitric oxide therapy. Those who are familiar with nitric oxide, it helps actually in dilating your blood vessels so that your blood pressure can go down. And there are certain foods you eat that will boost your nitric oxide compound. Now, noni juice, for example, helps to improve your nitric oxide in your blood, and so is beetroot as well. Now, nitric oxide decreases the tone in blood vessels. It keeps the pressure in your vasculature low. Now, the journal Science, that's the name of the journal, Science, actually named nitric oxide as the molecule of the year in the year 1992. Now, recent and ongoing studies have shown that nitric oxide administration can also inhibit SARS-CoV-2 replication, that is, COVID virus replication. When you administer nitric oxide to somebody, it will inhibit the replication or multiplication of the SARS-CoV-2 virus or COVID virus. Inhaled nitric oxide has been used successfully to treat severe COVID-19 patients on ventilators by improving the oxygenation of their blood. Because when nitric oxide causes the blood vessels to dilate, there's improved circulation, there's improved carrying of oxygen, and once the body is highly oxygenated, okay, COVID-19 doesn't stand a chance until it runs through its 10 to 7 to 14 day cycle, and then it is self-limiting. It goes out of the system. The body will have overpowered it. Because one of the things that COVID-19 infection does is to create a hypoxic situation. It lowers the amount of oxygen in that person's body. So as the oxygen level drops, that is one of the things that actually kills the infected person. But if you have something that can continue to boost the oxygen supply in that person's body, that can help the person to survive properly. 
Now, the fourth one I'll be talking about very mildly is carbon dioxide therapy. Now, many of us have thought of carbon dioxide as a very dangerous gas because, you see, we breathe out carbon dioxide, we breathe in oxygen, and so we think carbon dioxide has no therapeutic application. But recently, it has been discovered by scientists that carbon dioxide can actually have medical application. Now, carbon dioxide is commonly used, you know, during surgery such as laparoscopy or even endoscopy and arthroscopy to provide the surgeon better visibility of the surgical area by enlarging and stabilizing body cavities. Now, the irregular appearance of the skin surface, the cellulite, can also be altered by what we call carboxytherapy. That's carbon dioxide therapy, which is a transcutaneous infusion of carbon dioxide into the affected area. Carbon dioxide can also be used successfully for cryotherapy. Now, women who do um, pap smear and they find some precancerous lesions in their cervix, okay, that may lead to cervical cancer in the future, they can have a procedure called cryotherapy, where those cells are actually frozen to death, so to speak. Now, carbon dioxide therapy can also be used for cryotherapy, where temperatures of negative 76 degrees Celsius can be achieved, right? Using this technique, body cells are destroyed through crystallization, and this helps in the removal of warts, in the removal of moles, in the removal of skin tags, and also in destroying precancerous cells in the cervix of a woman is called cryotherapy. Cryotherapy. All right. Okay. So we are going to be focusing, like I said, on the remaining three very well. That is hydrogen, oxygen, and ozone. I call these the main therapeutic gases that we're going to be talking about. So let me start with number one. Uh, I know we can't go too far today on this one because our time is really, really running very fast. I wish we can tie down time so that we can spend more time. Now, but then, don't worry. By the special grace of God, we will all be here to have more and more Mondays so we can continue to share along this line. So let's start with number one, hydrogen. Hydrogen therapy. Now, hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. It constitutes nearly 75% of the universe's mass, hydrogen. Now, if you still remember your O-level chemistry. Now, when we were doing light therapy, I was emphasizing physics and physics and physics. But as we deal with therapeutic gases, we'll be talking more about chemistry, chemistry, chemistry. So again, if you run away from chemistry class in high school, this is payday for you. This is your payment time for running away from chemistry. Again, you know, I told you when I was, I was dealing with light therapy that I made an A1 in physics. Somebody actually sent me a message to say, congratulations, that was a feat. Again, may I announce to you that I also made an A1 in chemistry. Maybe I should also let you know I made an A1 in biology. <laughs> I also made an A1 in mathematics, by the way. Anyway, so let's come to chemistry, hydrogen. Hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, 75% of the mass of the universe. Now, hydrogen can be used therapeutically as well as prophylactically. Therapeutically means it can be used to treat existing diseases. And prophylactically means that it can be used to prevent diseases. So hydrogen is now being used to target all kinds of diseases. And you'll be amazed at the number of conditions that hydrogen therapy can actually help to address. Now, I first came across the use of hydrogen for therapy when I visited a particular uh, clinic here in Nigeria, where I live. Like I told you, when I travel abroad, I like to visit integrative clinics. I want to see what is trending. I want to see what is happening. I want to see new therapies, new approaches to doing things rather than being boxed into a box, old school box. And so in Nigeria, I found out that there are also very progressive doctors that are open-minded, that are very open to alternative therapies. And I found one of them in Lagos, Nigeria, who also uh, understands very well hydrogen therapy and is actually using it in his uh, alternative therapies, and I saw it for the first time, and then that made me to begin to dig 
and do my studies and my research on hydrogen therapy. So I found out that hydrogen is the fuel that actually powers the sun, and it can definitely also power the human body too. Hydrogen, uh, as far as we know, has no known biological toxicity and no side effect whatsoever. So it can be administered in different ways and it can be so beneficial to the body. Now, a lot of clinical studies on hydrogen therapy have been done. I was amazed when I was digging. I found out that there are over 1,500 published papers on the benefits of molecular hydrogen in health, wellness, and well-being. 1,500 published papers in peer-reviewed journals on the benefits of molecular hydrogen. Now, if you go to this website, uh, it's called www.clinicaltrials.gov.gov, www.clinicaltrials.gov. As at August 2020, there are over 700 ongoing clinical studies regarding the medical uses of molecular hydrogen. You won't believe it. And I think scientists in Nigeria, too, should begin to look in that direction, where we begin to study the clinical application of hydrogen and use it as a therapy. It's non-invasive, it is painless, it is affordable, and it's, it's fantastic in the effect that it produces. As we begin to share from subsequent episodes, you'll be amazed. Now, several studies have clearly indicated that hydrogen therapy is beneficial for at least confirmed about 170 diseases. 170 diseases can benefit from hydrogen therapy. I've been told that my time is up. So this is where we cut it off for today. I want you to join me same time, same platform next week, Monday, 8 p.m. Nigerian time. And if you miss it, you can also go back to our archives on YouTube and watch previous episodes and Make sure you keep a date with us and share this video with your friends, your colleagues, your relatives, your neighbors, your classmates, your enemies, everybody. And they will thank you for being so magnanimous in letting them to know that what we need is not more medication, but more education. And the best prescription is knowledge. To be informed is to be transformed. And to be uninformed is to be deformed. God bless you. Have a beautiful week ahead. Love you. Bye-bye. Introducing healthy newsletters on various health topics by Reverend Tony Akiyemi. Order, call, plus 234-90-732-92100.